part two chapters fifteen and sixteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen how marius had blood on his hands on entering the room marius perceived sauvaire seated at a table between claron and isnard the master stevedore had not quitted the two girls since the morning he rose stepped forward and pressed the young man's hand ah my friend he said how wrong you were not to have come with us we amused ourselves immensely these charmers are so funny they would make stones laugh they are the sort of ladies i like he dragged marius to the table where claron and isnard were drinking beer the young man sat down with a good deal of ill grace sir said isnard to him would you like me to go into partnership with you to-night no he answered dryly he's quite right to refuse cried sauvaire in a noisy voice you want to ruin him my dear you know the proverb lucky at cards unlucky in love and he added in a low voice addressing his companion why don't you make friends with her don't you see the glances she is casting at you marius rose without answering and went and sat at the card-table a game was about to commence and he was impatient to return to the sensations of the previous night he wished to follow the same tactics he placed fifty francs on the cloth and lost them he put fifty others there and lost them also gamblers are justly fatalists they know by experience that chance has its laws like everything else in this world that it labours sometimes for a whole night to make a man's fortune and that often the next day it works his ruin with the same persistence a moment comes when chance turns when a person who has won a long series of hands loses another series that is quite as long marius had arrived at one of those terrible moments he lost five times in succession sauvaire who had drawn near and was following his game bent over him and said rapidly don't play to-night you are not in luck you will lose all you won yesterday the young man shrugged his shoulders impatiently his throat became dry and the perspiration stood out on his forehead leave me alone he answered sharply i know what i'm doing i want all or nothing as you please replied the master stevedore i have gained some experience during the ten years i have been playing and watching others play in a few hours my good fellow you will not have a sou left it always happens like that he took a chair and sat down behind marius wishing to be present when his predictions were realized clairon and isnard who hoped to gather up a few pieces of gold as on the previous day also came and placed themselves near the young man they laughed gave themselves airs and sauvaire from time to time joked noisily with them the bursts of laughter and tittering which marius heard behind him exasperated him he was on the point of turning round two or three times to send sauvaire and the girls to the prince of darkness in despair at losing enervated by the strange and terrible hands that chance gave him he felt his anger rising within him and would have been glad to vent it on some one he had played at first as on the previous night with audacity and decision risking hands of five and relying on his good luck but that luck had gone his audacity did not serve him then he wanted to act prudently he dodged chance calculated the probabilities and finally played cleverly he lost just as often as before on several occasions he had eight and the banker nine fortune seemed to take bitter pleasure in stripping him on whom he had showered her favours it was indeed a fight to the death and at each fresh attack at each hand of cards marius was vanquished at the expiration of an hour he had already lost four thousand francs sauvaire kept singing out behind him what did i say i was certain of it and clairon and isnard who saw the bits of gold on which they relied disappearing began to make fun of the young man and to look about for some one more lucky marius bewildered in front of the gulf open before him turned towards sauvaire and said to him in a choking voice you who know how to play tell me what to do oh answered the master stevedore if you were to play like an angel you would lose chance is blind it goes you see where it likes one can never direct it you had better withdraw no no i'll see it out 
well then let us try play the series marius played the series hand on hand he lost five hundred francs the deuce exclaimed sauvaire play intermission then marius played intermission and lost again i warned you i warned you repeated the master stevedore try a martingale marius tried a martingale and had no better luck it's enough to drive one mad he exclaimed in anger don't play any more said sauvaire yes i will play i'll play to the end the master stevedore rose whistling between his teeth he could not understand his friend's nervous obstinacy he who never risks more than a hundred francs on the green cloth look here he continued the banker has thrown up his hand and is leaving take his place that perhaps will change the luck marius took the banker's seat he paid two francs for cards and slipped a franc into the slot in accordance with the custom of the club he shuffled the cards and then presented them to the player saying gentlemen the cards pass some of the players shuffled the cards again and returned them to marius who shuffled them a third time as was his right the game began again the young man could now lose all he had in a few hands he lost twice running sauvaire continued to remain behind him he ended by taking an interest in this intrepid youth the latter was about to deal the cards again to the players to the punters as they are called when the master stevedore stopped his arm and leaning over to his ear said to him in a low voice take care they are robbing you you are dealing the cards like a young innocent how do you mean yes you hold them up as you deal them so that the punters opposite see them pass and know what you have in your hand all new bankers are victimized like that keep the pack slanting in your hand and lower the cards as you deal them out marius followed this wise advice and did very well he won in a few hands he had got back a fairly large sum then chance turned again and he lost next a sort of equilibrium was established between his winning and losings little by little however he felt the ten thousand francs slipping through his fingers he neglected nothing to make his luck change on several occasions he stopped and called for fresh cards at another time he dealt his right hand out in order to lead chance astray and bring it back to him but all these tactics did him no good fortune now seemed to take pleasure in playing with its prey in making it suffer longer and not killing it at one blow then all at once she scratched it she took away what she had just given and even more sauvaire kept watch around the table so as to see that his friend was not cheated too much the latter had a man opposite him who was still young and who although playing for small stakes must already have won a good round sum each time the cards were favourable to him his stake was twenty-five francs and each time he lost he had only a silver five-franc piece before him which was a mascotte he said and he paid with another coin the master stevedore looked on this man with distrust he watched his movements and perceived that he concealed a twenty-five-franc gold piece under his five-franc piece in silver when he won he displayed it all and pocketed twenty-five francs when he lost he left the gold coin hidden under the large silver piece and only gave marius five francs it seems that not a night passes without this clever robbery being practised in one of the gambling houses at marseilles wait a bit wait a bit murmured sauvaire i'll nail you my gentleman in the hand that followed marius won the cheat was preparing to give him five francs in change when sauvaire stretched out his arm gave a flip to the five-franc piece and uncovered the gold coin beneath it you are cheating sir he exclaimed out you go the rascal did not lose countenance what are you meddling with he answered insolently he left his twenty-five francs on the table rose took a few turns in the room and withdrew without molestation the punters had limited themselves to growling marius turned very pale he had fallen then so low as that he was playing with thieves from that moment there was a cloud before his eyes which made him commit the grossest blunders he lost and was almost happy to lose all the fever had left him he no longer had the uncomfortable feeling in his throat the money when he touched it was burning hot he would have liked to have lost the whole of it and have to go away with empty pockets 
soon he had no more than two or three hundred francs before him since the commencement of the evening he had had a young man beside him who had followed all the changes of fortune with lively anxiety as he lost he became more pale and haggard he had begun with a considerable sum before him and gazed in despair on each piece of gold as it was swept away marius had heard him more than once utter disjointed words and had felt anxious about him he could see that a frightful drama was being performed at his elbow a final stroke completed his neighbor's ruin he remained for a moment motionless with contracted features then he placed a hand over his eyes drew a pistol rapidly from his pocket placed the barrel in his mouth and fired there was a sound like the crack of a whip the blood spurted out in large warm crimson drops fell on marius's hands all the players had risen in a fright the body had just fallen on the table the arms folded the head hanging down the bullet after piercing the neck had come out on the right below the ear and there was a red hole there from which ran a stream of blood a pool of gore was formed on the green cloth and in this pool the abandoned cards were soaking alarming sentences uttered in undertones passed among the gamblers do you know the poor fellow i think it's a collector of lambert and company his family is honourable his brother purchased a solicitor's practice six months ago he must have embezzled a large sum and killed himself when he lost it anyhow he might have shot himself somewhere else the police will be here in twenty minutes and close the club these people who have a mania for killing themselves are most annoying we were very well here we could gamble at ease now we must move have they sent to inform the police commissary yes i'm off there was a general stampede the players seized their hats and prudently slipped out on the landing one could hear them stumbling downstairs like drunkards marius had remained seated beside the corpse he could not move hand or foot he sat looking in a stupid way at the suicide's red neck and the splashes of blood covering his own hands his hair stood on end sparks of madness flashed in his eyes which were almost starting out of his head he still held the pack of cards all at once he threw them down shook his hands violently as if to get rid of the blood that was running between his fingers and uttering a harsh cry fled he did not even pick up the few hundreds of francs that were before him the pool increased little by little and the bits of gold now seemed bathed in a stream of blood only the corpse and the two girls remained in the room sauvert had been one of the first to fly when clairon and isnard found themselves alone they approached the table attracted by the gold glittering in the blood let's divide said isnard yes let's be quick answered clairon it's no good giving the police the money and each of them took a handful of gold from the middle of the crimson blood the coin stained with gore disappeared in their pockets then they wiped their fingers on their handkerchiefs and in their turn fled gasping for breath and fancying they heard the voice of the police commissary behind them it was three o'clock in the morning great gusts of wind were driving along the big dark clouds that sudded the grey sky with black a sort of mist floated in the air and fell in fine icy cold rain there is nothing more mournful than those hours of the early morning in a great city the streets are dirty the houses stand out in sad silhouettes marius ran like a madman through the silent and deserted streets he slipped on the greasy stones dipping his feet in the gutters and knocking up against the corners of the pavement and he continued running with his arms extended before him wringing his hands in furious rage he wanted to go and dip them in the sea and wash them with all the water of the ocean there only could he find relief for the terrible burn that was devouring him he ran alarmed and fierce still wringing his hands and taking out of the way streets like a murderer at moments he was half mad he imagined it was he who had killed the suicide to rob him of fifteen thousand francs then he heard the heavy tread of the gendarme behind him he hastened the pace not knowing where to hide his hands which would bear witness against him he had to cross the cour bazins workmen were passing along under the trees and he experienced most horrible anguish to avoid descending to the harbour by the canebiere he plunged into the old town there the streets are dark and narrow and no one could see his blood-stained hands he reached the place aux oeufs it was only then that he thought of fine 
he remembered all at once that she was matno that she might already be on the place and would see him covered with blood she would question him and he would be unable to answer her he knew nothing all was confusion in his head he found himself lost in a nightmare his hands burned him that was all and he continued running ran to go and plunge them in the sea and extinguish the coals clinging to his flesh he descended the narrow streets the steep inclines at the risk of breaking his head twenty times over twice he slipped and fell each time he rose with a bound and continued his race at length he perceived the black masses of vessels lying silent in the dense water of the port he ran along the white polished slabs of stone and as he could find no boat he for an instant had the insane idea of flinging himself into the water and thus appeasing his sufferings at a single stroke the burns he thought he felt became intolerable he yelled and wept but having at last found a little pleasure craft fastened at the edge of the quay he leapt into it lay down on his stomach and feverishly plunged his arms into the sea up to the shoulders a profound sigh of relief escaped him the cool water appeased his fever the wavelets washed away the blood that was gnawing into his hands he remained lying thus for a long time forgetting all not even remembering why he was there every now and then he drew his arms out of the water and furiously rubbed his hands looked at them and rubbed them again he seemed always to perceive large red spots on his skin then he plunged his arms into the sea again made the water move gently to and fro enjoying intense delight at the sensation of the cold seizing him and sending a shiver all over his body at the end of an hour he was still there thinking there would never be sufficient water in the sea to wash his hands however little by little his ideas became calm and his head heavy it seemed as if his brain were empty icy shivers ran over all his limbs mechanically step by step he reached the rue Sainte without thinking of anything he no longer knew where he had come from nor what he had done he went to bed and was seized with a terrible fever chapter sixteen mademoiselle claire's prayer book marius remained three weeks in bed a prey to violent delirium he had an attack of acute cerebral fever which brought him to death's door his youth and the tender attention he received saved him one evening at twilight he opened his eyes with a clear head it seemed to him that he had issued from profound darkness he was so weak that he had no feeling in his body but the fever had disappeared and his thoughts which were still vacillating returned to him the curtains were drawn round his bed a soft warm light came through the white linen and surrounded him with gentle brightness the air of the silent room was pervaded with perfume he raised himself and at the slight noise he made he saw a shadow glide behind the curtains who is there he inquired in a voice that was hardly distinct a hand quietly drew aside the curtains and fine seeing marius sitting up exclaimed joyfully heaven be praised you are saved my friend and she began to weep the invalid understood all and extended his poor thin hands towards the girl thanks he said to her i knew you were there i felt as if i had had a frightful dream and i remember now in the midst of that dream i saw you bending over me like a mother he let his head fall on the pillow and continued in a childish voice i have been very ill have i not all is over do not let us think of such disagreeable things said the flower girl gaily but where had you been to my friend the sleeves of your coat were all wet marius passed his hand across his forehead oh i remember he exclaimed it's frightful then he gave fine an account of the two terrible nights he had passed in the gambling-house he made her a confession retracing in detail all he had suffered it's a terrible lesson he remarked in conclusion i doubted and turned to chance for a moment i shuddered i fancied i felt all the instincts of the gambler within me but i've been cured with a red-hot iron he stopped and then continued anxiously how long have i been ill about three weeks answered fine oh heavens three weeks lost we have only about twenty days before us do not trouble about that but get well hasn't mr martelli sent to inquire about me 
don't worry yourself i tell you i have been to see him and everything is arranged marius seemed more calm and fine continued there is only one course to follow and that is to borrow money from m martelli we should have commenced by that all will be well now sleep do not speak the doctor has forbidden it the convalescence advanced at rapid strides thanks to fine's tender and devoted care the young girl understood that her smile would now suffice to cure marius and each morning she came with that and her fresh breath which filled the little room with a puff of spring ah how nice it is to be ill the invalid often repeated the two lovers passed a charming week in this way their love had increased amidst the suffering and dread of death a new bond united them henceforth they were one when at the expiration of a week of gay and touching intimacy marius was able to get downstairs and go for a short walk in the sun on the cour bonaparte he and fine were taken for two lovers on the morrow of their betrothal they had been affianced in the midst of devotedness and grief now as they walked along slowly the flower-girl supported the young man who was still weak and gazed at him with bewitching eyes she was proud of her work proud at her lover's recovery and he thanked her with smiles full of passionate gratitude the next day the clerk wished to go back to his office and fine had to get angry to make him remain at home a day or two longer he was impatient to see m martelli he desired to feel the ground and ascertain if he could rely on the ship-owner but there is no hurry said the flower-girl with a calmness that astounded the young man we have a whole week before us it will suffice if we have the money at the last moment at the end of two days marius obtained the young girl's permission to return to his work and it was arranged between them that they would leave for aix on the following monday fine spoke as if she had the amount necessary for philippe's liberty in her pocket marius went to his office and was received by m martelli with paternal kindness the ship-owner wanted to give him another week's holiday but the young man assured him that work would complete his convalescence he felt ashamed in his presence he was thinking that in two or three days he would be making an effort to borrow a large sum of money from him and that thought troubled him moreover m martelli gazed at him with a piercing look that quite embarrassed him i have seen mademoiselle fine said the ship-owner accompanying him into his office she is a charming person a noble heart be very fond of her my friend he smiled again and withdrew when marius was alone he experienced inestimable delight at finding himself in the small office where he had lived and worked so long he again took possession of his little domain found pleasure in seating himself before his table in touching the papers and pens lying there he had been almost dead and he was once more face to face with his daily placid existence the room in which he was working was opposite the ship-owner's private apartments and sometimes visitors made a mistake and knocked at his door on that particular morning as he was about to get to work he heard two discreet knocks and shouted to come in a man dressed in a long black frock coat made his appearance he was shaven his manner was gentle and he had all the humble and sneaking demeanour of a person connected with the roman catholic church mademoiselle claire martelli he inquired marius who was occupied in examining him did not answer he was wondering where on earth he had seen this devout personage before the man was hesitating but he at last pulled a prayer-book confined in a case out of the immense pockets of his overcoat i have brought her he continued in a fluty voice her prayer-book which she forgot yesterday evening in a confessional marius continued wondering where on earth have i seen the face of that canting rascal the man no doubt understood the mute interrogation of his look he bent his head slightly adding i am the beadle of the church of st victor these few words were like a beam of light for the young man he remembered having seen the individual before him in the vestry room on one occasion when he went to fetch abbe chastanier his intelligence received a sort of shock that stimulated it and urged on by the power of divination as it were he said it was m donadet who sent you was it not yes answered the beadle after further hesitation very good give me the prayer-book i will hand it to mademoiselle claire but the abbe particularly told me i was to give it to no one but the young lady she shall have it in a moment perhaps she is not up yet you will be disturbing her you promise me to do the errand certainly 
tell the young lady that the abbe found this prayer-book in his confessional yesterday and told me to bring it to her the abbe sends his compliments to mademoiselle i will tell her all that rest assured the beadle placed the prayer-book on the table and withdrew after making a bow but in closing the door he hesitated again and looked distrustful when he had at last gone marius could not help feeling surprised at his persistence in wishing to see mademoiselle claire himself he vaguely remembered the praises donna day had bestowed on m martelli's young sister he looked at the prayer-book and his thoughts were busy with all kinds of reasonings and explanations he stretched out his arm and took the prayer-book he drew it from its case it was one of those bulky volumes almost square with a handsome binding and corners in open silver-work the initials of the young girl were interlaced on one of the sides as marius contemplated the book and turned it over in his hands he perceived a thin piece of paper peeping out from the gilt edges prompted by a feeling of curiosity which he did not seek to explain he opened the volume and a sheet of paper folded in four slipped out of it before him it was a pretty sheet of pink paper exhaling a slight smell of incense marius was about to return it to the book but as he took it up he saw it was marked with the initial d and a cross in relief he rapidly unfolded it and read as follows dear soul you whose salvation has been entrusted to me by the lord listen i beg of you to the scheme i have formed for your eternal happiness i have never dared explain that scheme to you verbally fearing to give way to the adorable emotions that your righteousness creates within me you cannot remain any longer in your brother's house it is a place of perdition your brother is devoted to the abominable worship of modern idols come come with me we will find a solitary spot where i will place you in the hands of the almighty perhaps my tears and trembling have made you penetrate the secret of my heart i love you as the holy church our mother loves the pure souls that come to her i dream of you each night i see you entwined in a celestial embrace and we both rise to heaven exchanging angelic kisses ah do not resist the voice that is calling you come there is a superior religion which we do not reveal to the vulgar that religion unites creatures together it makes spouses not martyrs bear in mind our conversations say to yourself that i love you and come i await you at my house i shall have a post-chaise in an adjoining street marius was astounded after reading this abbe donadei actually suggested an elopement to mademoiselle claire it is true his letter was pervaded with incense with rakish cloudy mysticism which hid the brutal meaning of his thoughts beneath the devout and fondling sweetness of words the sense was paraphrased diluted in that odd style of expression which some roman catholic priests affect but abbe donadei had not been able to find a religious periphrasis for the post-chaise and his hypocritical letter ended coarsely by a gendarme-like offer which no one could misinterpret the graceful abbe to have cast aside the sly prudence that guided him in all his acts must have been carried away by fierce desire the clerk read and re-read the letter asking himself what he had better do he felt indignant his anger rose within him but one anxiety restrained him he was ignorant as to the harm that had been done he did not know what mademoiselle claire thought and he was afraid lest donna day in the mysterious seclusion of the confessional had not already succeeded in troubling the young girl's heart before striking the priest he wanted to be sure that he would not at the same time strike his victim for nothing in the world would he have run the risk of creating a scandal that would certainly have killed m martelli he resolved that if the abbe were to be the only one to suffer to punish him in an original way he took the prayer-book and went to mademoiselle claire in great alarm lest her face should display incriminating emotion End of chapters fifteen and sixteen part two chapter seventeen and eighteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen in which sauveur makes up his mind to have his money's worth of fun mademoiselle claire martelli was a tall handsome girl of twenty-three whom circumstances had thrown into devotion 
she was to have married one of her cousins who was accidentally drowned at andoum during a pleasure trip despair had brought her nearer to god and little by little she had tasted such sweetness in frequenting churches that she had fallen asleep as it were in the penetrating perfume of the incense soothed by the murmuring voices of the priests hers was not precisely a religious mind it was a gentle and contemplative one which religion had consoled and which was grateful on that account perhaps one of these days there might be an awakening and she would return to the joys of the world in the meanwhile she lived a rather retired calm life and her tastes were simple her brother who was a free thinker and a republican of broad intellect and a kindly nature allowed her to do as she pleased she only took advantage of his position as head of the family to protect her interests and assure her an independent position marius found mademoiselle claire in a small drawing-room where she generally worked at baby linen which she gave away to the poor the young girl knew marius and treated him affectionately as a friend of the family m martelli had often taken his clerk with him to an estate he owned near estac and there marius and claire had become good friends brave hearts find each other out and are not long in coming to an understanding the beautiful devout on seeing the clerk enter jumped up and held out her hand to him ah it's you marius she exclaimed gaily so you're well again so much the better heaven has granted my prayer the young man felt very much touched at this friendly welcome he gazed in the young girl's eyes and found not there but a pure flame and a look of calm virginity that look appeared to him so tranquil and straightforward that he felt as if relieved of a lump that had been choking him i thank you he answered but i have not come to show you a ghost and handing her the prayer-book he added here is a mass-book which it appears you left behind you yesterday at st victor ah yes said the young girl i was going to send and fetch it how did it come into your hands a beetle just brought it a beetle yes from abbe donaday claire took the book and placed it quietly on a piece of furniture without showing the least concern marius followed her anxiously with his eyes if the slightest colour had risen to her cheeks he would have thought all lost by the way continued the young girl sitting down i think you know m chastanier yes answered marius astonished he is an excellent man is he not certainly he has a good heart and a profoundly pious and upright mind my brother has sung his praises to me loudly but in religious matters you know i do not place unlimited confidence in my brother she smiled marius could not understand what she was coming to only he found her so quiet and happy that he felt entirely reassured i see abbe chastanier is a positive saint she continued and from to-morrow i shall entrust him with the care of directing my conscience are you going to leave abbe donadei exclaimed marius warmly the young girl again raised her head surprised at the clerk's tone of voice yes i am leaving him she answered very simply he is young and has the light mind of an italian besides i have learnt ugly things about him she continued stitching quietly with her needle there was not a tremor in her hands and her forehead remained white and pure then marius withdrew convinced that he could act without wounding this virgin conscience and that while punishing donna day he would punish him only he did not know the real cause that had decided claire to change her confessor perhaps she had understood that she was no longer in safety in the hands of the gallant abbe but in any case there had been no act or word at which she had cause to blush marius had preserved the soft pink paper containing donna day's declaration he could have simply taken it to the bishop of marseilles but he preferred to punish and deride the abbe himself in return for his having impudently made fun of him when he had sought to recommend philippe to his kindness his plan was formed only to put it into execution he required the assistance of sauvaire he did not return to his office after lunch but went in search of the master stevedore in all the cafes sauvaire was not to be found he then made up his mind to go and ask cadet cougourdan if he knew where his principal was in hiding oh he is not hiding himself that's not his habit answered cadet laughing he must be in a restaurant at the reserve and i'll bet he's trying to show himself to all marseilles marius went down to the port and was rowed to the reserve in one of those small pleasure boats supplied with a spare red and yellow striped awning the boat glided slowly over the dense water of the harbour amidst refuse of all sorts orange peel vegetable remains objects without a name which were gathered together in a sort of whitish froth and it continued on its way in the middle of a passage preserved between the vessels skimming along in proximity to their dark sides 
it was as if lost in a forest which shot up on all sides its straight slender stems each surmounted by a shred of crimson bunting before marius had landed he could hear the noisy laughter of sauveur seated at a table on a terrace of a restaurant he could not be seen but he arranged matters so as to make known he was there the restaurants at the reserve resemble those at asnières and st cloud they are chalets pavilions all kinds of ugly architectural conceptions as a matter of fact they are built of plaster and planks and the blasts of wind threaten to blow them out to sea sauveur delighted in frequenting these restaurants because the charges there are very high and one can be seen a long way off marius guided by the master stevedore's elevated voice found him at once he was on a terrace with clairon and isnard whom he no longer left he was convinced he had the appearance of being more wealthy when dragging two women along with him one on each arm the terrace trembled beneath the storm of sauveur's gaiety moreover the worthy man was getting slightly tipsy bravo bravo he shouted perceiving marius we will begin lunching again we have been lunching since noon we have eaten cockles bouillabaisse tunny he continued and enumerated a dozen dishes with childlike pride he felt quite flattered at having given himself indigestion hey he continued one is very comfortable here it's expensive but everything is very correct what will you have to eat marius excused himself pointing out that it was three o'clock and that he had lunched long before go along with you one can always eat exclaimed sauveur delighted at being caught at such a rakish pleasure party we are going on eating like this until evening it'll cost money but so much the worse clairon my girl you'll get drunk if you take so much champagne clairon paid no attention to the remark and swallowed another large glass besides she had nothing to fear as she was tipsy already good heavens how amusing these women are continued sauveur rising and fanning himself with his napkin he went towards the balustrade on the terrace and shouted out very loud so as to be heard by the passers-by i've already spent a great deal of money with them but i don't regret it they're so comical marius leant over towards him do you want to have a good evening to-morrow he asked him of course i do answered sauveur it will cost you a few louis the deuce will it be very funny very funny indeed you shall have your money's worth of laughter i accept then all marseilles will hear of the affair and they'll be talking of you for a week afterwards i accept i accept very well listen marius bent down to sauveur's ear and spoke to him in a low voice he explained his plan an instant later the master stevedore burst into a fit of laughter that almost choked him he thought the thing funny very funny that's agreed he said when marius had told him his secret i will be on the boulevard de la corderie with clairon to-morrow evening at ten o'clock ah what a good joke chapter eighteen how abbe donadei eloped with a sister soul to his own abbe donadei had allowed himself to be overcome by one of those violent desires which sometimes burst out in cunning sneaking natures he so clever so prudent had been guilty of a clumsy mistake he was conscious of it when the beetle had left with the prayer-book and love-letter from that moment he must be prepared to meet all the consequences of his audacious act claire had excited a yearning in him which he meant to satisfy in spite of all he was beyond the sacred scruples of his calling he looked on things human from too lofty a height he had mixed in too many jobs of a more or less honourable nature to hesitate at a seduction that was the least thing that troubled him it was the sequel to the seduction at which he felt alarmed for two long months he had tried to attract the young girl to his house then as she was about to accede to his wish in all simplicity he had renounced that plan convinced that an intrigue of this nature could not be carried on in the midst of marseilles it was thus that he had little by little reached the point of wishing to play all for all like a daring gambler his passion was increasing and torturing him and he was ready to exchange his influential position for a woman's free and entire love he preferred to elope with claire openly and fly with her to italy donna day was too sharp and intelligent not to have thought of a retreat 
if the young girl in the long run had been in his way he would have shut her up in a convent and obtained the forgiveness of his uncle the cardinal when he had examined and calculated everything an elopement seemed to him the most easy and prompt of all plans and the one which presented the least danger he only feared one thing that clare would not keep the appointment and would refuse to run away with him then the love-letter would become a terrible arm he would be without the girl and might lose his position but he was blinded by desire he did not notice the calm candour of his penitent but took the acts of adoration addressed to the almighty for so many mute avowals made to himself however he had still fears and regretted having advanced too far to be able to retreat all his prudence and cowardice returned to him and he impatiently awaited the beadle's return as soon as he caught sight of him he exclaimed well i gave the book answered the beadle to the young lady herself yes to the young lady the beadle made this answer with superb self-possession on his way back he regretted having given marius the prayer-book and as he saw that he had performed his errand very badly he determined to lie in order to deserve the abbe's good will donadet felt somewhat reassured he judged that if the young girl felt offended at the note she would burn it hazard forgetting a prayer-book had hastened a solution that he had been seeking so long he had now only to wait the next morning he received the visit of a veiled lady whose features he was unable to distinguish this person handed him a letter and promptly withdrew the missive only contained these words yes to-night donna day was beside himself with delight and set about making his preparations for departure if any one had followed the veiled lady they would have seen her join the gallant sauveur who was awaiting her in the rue du petit chantier she raised her veil it was clairon he's a very nice fellow that abbe she said on reaching the master stevedore does he please you so much the better answered sauveur and they went off bursting with laughter at about half-past nine in the evening clairon and sauveur were again in the rue du petit chantier they walked slowly stopping at each step as if waiting for some one clairon who was dressed simply in a black woollen gown had her face hidden beneath a thick veil sauveur was disguised as a commissionaire here's marius the latter suddenly exclaimed are you ready inquired the young man in an undertone as soon as he was close to them do you know your parts well of course answered the master stevedore you'll see how we can act ah the good joke i shall be laughing over it for the next six months go on to the abbe's we will wait for you here be prudent sauveur went and knocked at donadet's door it was opened by the abbe himself who was attired in a travelling suit and seemed very excited what do you want he inquired roughly disappointed at seeing a man before him i have come with a young lady answered the sham commissionaire good let her come in quickly she would not come up to the door ah she said like this tell the gentleman that i prefer going straight to the carriage wait a minute i have something to take with me yes but you see the young lady is afraid standing in the middle of the boulevard then run quick and tell her that the post chaise is at the corner of the rue des tyrans let her get in i shall be there in five minutes donna day banged the door too and sauveur held his sides and almost split with silent laughter this adventure beat everything he had ever heard of he returned to the rue du petit chantier where clairon and marius were awaiting him everything is proceeding marvellously well he said to them in an undertone the abbe falls into the trap with angelic innocence i know where the post chaise is i noticed it coming along said marius it is at the corner of the rue des tyrans that's it there is not a moment to spare the abbe has promised to be there in five minutes all three set off along the boulevard de la corderie as far as the rue des tyrans skirting the houses there they perceived the post chaise standing in the shade all loaded and ready to start at the first crack of the whip marius and sauveur hid themselves under the archway of a great door clairon stood before them in the road sauveur and clairon joked in a low voice while awaiting the abbe pooh he will not care for me said clairon he will cast me off at the first change of horses who knows he's very nice i was afraid he would be old 
but i say you seem in love with the abbe oh i'm not jealous only if you're going off so willingly with him you might return the thousand francs i gave you to persuade you to assist us the thousand francs oh indeed and if he suddenly leaves me must not i pay for my journey back i was joking my dear i don't take back what i have given besides i'm having my money's worth of laughter marius intervened repeating his instructions to clairon do exactly as i told you he said try to arrange so that he does not discover the trick until he is some leagues from marseilles do not speak play your part with art when he has discovered everything act firmly tell him i have his note and am determined to take it to the bishop if you suffer the least harm or if he shows himself here again advise him to go and seek fortune elsewhere can i return at once to marseilles inquired clairon certainly i only want to drive him from the city by making him ridiculous for ever i could have had him expelled from the church by his superiors but i prefer annihilating him by mockery sauveur was splitting with laughter at the thought of the scene between abbe donadei and clairon eh my dear he continued tell him you are married and that your husband will no doubt be seeking you everywhere to prosecute you for your misconduct shall i run after you and put your ravisher in a horrible fright the idea of this joke so amused sauveur that he very nearly choked with hilarity in the meanwhile marius had noticed a dark form advancing rapidly towards them silence he exclaimed here i think is our man attend to your part clairon place yourself in front of the carriage door sauveur and marius secreted themselves more closely in their hiding-place and clairon with her face thickly veiled and dressed all in black stood in the shadow thrown by the post-chaise it was donna dei quite out of breath he had thrown off the cowl and looked very smart in ordinary mufti dear dear claire he murmured with emotion kissing clairon's hand how good of you to have come claire clairon muttered sauveur it's all the same ah providence must have advised you continued the priest pushing the girl gently into the carriage and then following her we are off to paradise he added the postilion cracked his whip and the post-chaise started away with a frightful rumbling noise sauveur and marius then showed themselves laughing until they almost cried hey the abbe is eloping with the sister's soul to his own said marius a pleasant journey abbe cried sauveur when the chaise had disappeared in the night bearing away donna dei and clairon the master stevedore and young clerk sauntered down the boulevard de la corderie chatting about the adventure and giving way to sudden displays of gaiety at the thought of the priest travelling alone with this creature can you fancy the face he'll make presently said sauveur when he raises clairon's veil between you and me and the lamp-post you know clairon is ugly she is at least forty the master stevedore willingly acknowledged clairon's age and ugliness since the girl's forty summers and fainted countenance made the joke he was playing the more amusing he was splitting with laughter and anxious to reach the canebiere to tell his friends the story marius who was more serious was thinking he had given the priest the company he deserved he left the master stevedore at about eleven o'clock at night and went home at midnight every one at marseilles who had not then retired to rest knew that abbe donadei had just eloped in a post-chaise with a girl who had been wallowing in all the debauchery of the city for the previous fifteen years sauveur had been shouting out the news in the cafés and had related the adventure with a wonderful profusion of detail that precious phrase of the graceful abbe as he got into the chaise we're off to paradise was repeated from mouth to mouth they knew he had kissed her hand and they speculated as to the reason why the amorous couple had fled the best part of the business was that sauveur not knowing why marius had had clairon carried off displayed absolute naivete he understood that if donna dei's passion for her could be made to appear serious the joke would be all the more funny and he therefore lied with all the assurance of an inhabitant of the south of france he made believe that the priest was really dying of love for this wrinkled sallow-faced creature worn out with shame who was known to every one there was general astonishment universal mockery people could not believe that the gallant abbe with whom the penitent ladies of marseilles were so charmed had run away with such a woman and they jeered to their heart's content at the monstrous alliance 
next day the scandal was known to the whole city sauvaire triumphed and became a personage they knew he had been clarence's last protector and that the abbe had stolen the girl away from him all day he sauntered up and down the canebiere in slippers comically receiving the condolences of his intimate acquaintances he shouted out very loud answering some calling to others using and abusing of his popularity he certainly did not regret his thousand francs he had never put out money for his amusement at so high a rate of interest the scandal became awful when clarent returned two days later sauvaire bought her a silk gown and drove about marseilles with her for a week in an open carriage people pointed them out and ran to their doors as they passed by the master stevedore almost burst with delight clarent had gone as far as toulon abbe donadey had not been long in discovering the kind of person he was eloping with he had then flown into a frightful rage and wanted to throw her out on the highway at one o'clock in the morning far from any dwelling but clarent was not to be so easily got rid of she had talked big and threatened the abbe making use of the arms marius held in his hands donadey trembling and compelled to give way had been obliged to conduct his companion as far as toulon where they separated clarent returning to marseilles and the priest hurrying across the frontier sauvaire drove the young person so much about and raised such an outcry that the authorities took the matter in hand and at the bishop's request sent clarent to exercise the power of her charms elsewhere since then the master stevedore in his effusive moments which occurred ten or twelve times a day was in the habit of saying to all who liked to listen to him ah if you only knew what a pretty person i had under my protection it was the priests who took her away from me End of chapters 17 and 18part two chapters nineteen and twenty of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen philip's ransom marius went to his office on the day following the elopement delighted with his expedition of the previous evening he had just saved an honourable family from despair and had delivered the city of an intriguing man against whom he had moreover a personal grievance he was about to set work with a light heart and tranquil conscience when they came and told him that m martelli would be pleased to see him on his way to the drawing-room the young man suddenly made up his mind to ask his principal to lend him the money for philippe's ransom this decision set him all of a tremble he felt he would never dare to make such a request if he did not do so by a sort of impulse as he had to see m martelli it would be useless to wait any longer it would be better to risk the application at once he found m martelli and abbe chastanier in the drawing-room the ship-owner was pale and his eyes were sparkling with anger he came straight to the clerk and speaking rapidly said to him you are a straightforward and courageous young man and i thought i would not act in such a serious matter as this without asking your advice abbe chastanier appeared sad and ashamed he made himself quite small in an armchair his poor hands trembling with age and grief i have just had this gentleman's visit continued m martelli to marius pointing out the old priest and have received information of a plot that has quite upset me be calm for mercy's sake interrupted the priest do not make me repent having done my duty as an upright man in coming to set you on your guard i may have been unnecessarily alarmed you would not be here sir if your suspicions were not based on certitude i thank you for your visit i understand the feelings of dignity that have brought you to my house and i understand the final effort you are making to protect the infamous the ship-owner turned to marius and continued in a bitter tone only fancy a priest is trying at this moment to dishonour me this gentleman has just told me to watch over claire he has informed me with many omissions that abbe donadey exercises a dangerous influence over her and that he fears ah oh, if that wretch has tarnished the child's purity i'll kill him like a dog abbe chastanier hung his head he did not regret the steps he had taken he had acted as an upright man but he was quite overcome at m martelli's explosion of anger he suffered as much as if he had been guilty himself he felt ashamed for the entire church the ship-owner became a little more calm and after a few moments silence continued 
i did not want to come to a decision before consulting a quiet and intelligent man and i sent for you marius my first impulse was to run to this priest and smack him in the face there is perhaps another course to pursue that would be better marius had listened quietly to his principal and this somewhat tranquillized abbe chastanier the young man who had his answer already was not thinking of donna day he was wondering how he could solicit a loan at that moment he heard m martelli say to him in a loud voice come in my place what would you do the young man smiled i would do what i have already done he answered simply and he gave an account of clarence's elopement from the first words as soon as the young man had spoken of the interview he had had with claire about the prayer-book m martelli pressed his hands effusively the certitude that his sister had not dreamt of the peril through which she had passed gave him great joy he became quite gay when he had heard the whole account of the adventure and even abbe chastanier could not restrain a sad smile i should not have confessed to you concluded marius the part i had taken in this mystification if you had remained in ignorance of the danger threatening you i merely wish to reassure you do not try to escape my gratitude exclaimed the shipowner i already looked on you as an adopted son and you have just rendered me so great a service that i really do not know how to recompense you speaking thus he took marius aside and then gave him a kind and encouraging look in the face have you no secret to tell me he inquired in an undertone marius became troubled you are a great child continued m martelli fortunately i saw mademoiselle fine during your illness otherwise i should still be in ignorance wait i'll sign you a draft for fifteen thousand francs which you can encash at once in the counting-house if you wish marius on hearing the shipowner's generous offer was spellbound to the spot he turned pale and inexpressible emotion filled his eyes with great tears he felt like choking and was afraid of bursting out into sobs hey what he was suddenly offered this money which he had been seeking for in despair for so many months he had asked for nothing and his dearest wishes were satisfied he thought he must be dreaming m martelli had gone towards the table he sat down and was preparing to write out an order on his firm but before doing so he raised his head and simply said to marius it's fifteen thousand francs that you require is it not this question drew the young man from his stupor he joined his hands and said in a trembling voice how is it you know my secret thoughts what have i done that you should be so good and generous the shipowner smiled i will not say to you as they do to children that my little finger has told me all but in truth i received the visit of a fairy have i not already confessed it to you mademoiselle fine came to see me the young man at last understood he thanked warmly from the bottom of his heart the good angel who while saving him from death had worked to bring him tranquillity and hope he now understood the flower-girl's placid smiling countenance when he had spoken to her of philippe she was certain of the prisoner's safety she had accomplished all alone the whole of the hard work connected with raising a loan marius hardly knew if he ought to throw himself at m martelli's feet or at fine's he was overcome with gratitude the shipowner was delighted to see his clerk's countenance lit up with joy his eyes met those of abbe chastanier who had remained seated and the two men understood each other the freethinker the republican as well as the priest experienced the joy of doing good the delicious sensation of making another happy and of being present to see that happiness but exclaimed marius amidst his delight i do not know when i shall be able to refund you so large a sum do not let that trouble you answered the shipowner you have rendered me great services you have perhaps just saved me from dishonour allow me to oblige you without it being a question of refunding between us and as a sort of gloom passed across marius's forehead he took his hand and added i do not mean to pay for your devotedness my friend i know there are some debts that cannot be settled with money i beg you to look at the matter in a different light you have been with me for the last ten years and i trust you will remain much longer well the fifteen thousand francs i am about to give you are a gratuity a small share in the profits i have made with your help you cannot refuse m martelli bent forward to sign the order when marius stopped him again 
do you know the use i am going to make of this money he inquired with some concern the shipowner laid down his pen annoyed and rather pale good heavens he exclaimed how difficult it is to oblige straightforward people they compel you to know everything but for mercy's sake do not make me your accomplice i am aware you are a good fellow a devoted and affectionate soul that is all i have no need to know about all your acts and all your thoughts you will never do a bad action will you that's quite enough for me m martelli obedient to a scruple which was quite reasonable wished to appear ignorant that the money he was giving marius was going to purchase a conscience but apart from that he lent a willing hand to philippe's escape being aware of the arms m de casalis had made use of to imprison the young man however in principle he wished to preserve his republican austerity intact he had made up his mind that he would not openly be an accomplice of the escape marius insisted then abbe chastanier intervened with that blind sentiment of charity that always made him accept the heaviest responsibilities do not refuse he said to the young man i know your plans and i will be your guarantor with m martelli that what you want to do is right and legitimate he smiled with his meek smile of an old man marius understood what supreme charity had dictated his words and warmly shook his hands in the meantime the shipowner had signed the draft for fifteen thousand francs there he said handing marius the paper i advise you to go to the counting-house at once and as the young man after thanking him again was about to withdraw he called him back look here he added you must still be a little out of sorts take a week's holiday you will work all the better afterwards he wished to give him time to deliver philippe marius understood it and was again moved to tears he hastened away so as not to cry like a child and repaired at once to the counting-house when he had the fifteen thousand francs in his pocket he went downstairs in four jumps then he ran along the street like a madman to find fine the flower-girl was just then in her little room on the place aux Eux. marius burst in on her laughing and dancing like a lunatic took the young girl in his arms and gave her a spanking kiss on each cheek then he spread the fifteen banknotes out on the table fine who was astonished and almost frightened at his sudden entrance now began to laugh and clap her hands a charming scene full of mutual tenderness and effusive thanks followed marius vowed he was a simpleton and that she alone had saved the ship he kissed her hands fell on his knees before her and gazed up at her face with a troubled expression of ecstasy she on her side blushed protested warmly and sought to prove that she did not deserve the least acknowledgment for six months they had given themselves up entirely to a difficult task and had knocked in vain at every door and now all of a sudden philippe's ransom was spread out before their eyes naturally they forgot all their anxiety and fear all the shame and stupidity with which they had momentarily come in contact there was nothing in their hearts at present but tranquillity and intense joy before separating they arranged that they would leave for x the following morning chapter twenty the escape the next morning at about seven o'clock marius hired a cabriolet he did not wish to go by the diligence and as he needed a vehicle for the flight he preferred to hire one at marseilles which would take him to x and serve to bring back his brother on the previous evening he had made an arrangement with the sea captain to convey philippe to genoa marius and fine set out at nine o'clock the young man driving it was quite a pleasure party for the two lovers at the hill of la viste they got down and ran along the road like children letting the horse come on at his own pace they breakfasted in a small room at an auberge at satem and at dessert sketched out a multitude of plans for the future now that philippe was about to be set at liberty they could think of their marriage and were quite affected as they saw the time approaching when they would be able to love in peace the remainder of the journey was also very gay towards noon they passed beside the alberta's property and stopped again to give the horse breath and take rest themselves beneath the trees on the right-hand side of the road reaching x at three o'clock notwithstanding all the delay they still arrived too soon so as not to arouse suspicion they had decided not to go to the prison until the evening in the meantime the young man left the cabriolet in care of his companion in a deserted street 
and proceeded to the house of his relative isna who placed horse and trap in safety promising to bring them at midnight precisely to the summit of the hill of arc when these precautions had been taken the two young people hid themselves until dark as marius and fine were returning to isna's shop the former at the turn of his street almost fell into the arms of m de cazalis but he walked on rapidly with his head bent down and the deputy did not notice him nevertheless the young man was in despair at this meeting he felt extremely anxious fearing that some new misfortune might happen at the eleventh hour to prevent him bringing his task to a happy issue m de cazalis had no doubt come to aix to hasten his vengeance he thought and had perhaps succeeded marius was in a fever until the evening and the most strange ideas passed through his mind now that he had the money he dreaded meeting with other obstacles at last at nine o'clock he went to the jail accompanied by fine the two young people knocked at the massive door a heavy step was heard and a harsh voice inquired what they wanted it is us uncle exclaimed fine open the door open quick monsieur revertiga added marius in his turn the voice grumbled and answered in a surly tone monsieur revertiga is no longer here he is ill the wicket was shut and marius and fine stood mute and bewildered at the closed door the flower girl had not thought it necessary to write to her uncle for four months she had his promise and that sufficed so the news of his illness fell on her and her companion like a thunderbolt it had never struck them that the old fellow might be ill and now all their efforts were paralyzed by an unforeseen impediment they had philippe's ransom and were unable to deliver him when they had in a measure recovered from their painful astonishment fine drew herself up let us go and see my uncle she exclaimed he must be with one of his cousins in the rue de la glaciere what's the use answered marius all is lost no no come along he followed her as if bowed down by despair while she stepped out boldly unable to believe that chance could possibly be so cruel revertiga was in fact at his cousin's in the rue de la glaciere he had been laid up there for a fortnight when he saw the young people enter he understood their errand he raised himself up kissed his niece on the forehead and said to her with a smile well the hour has come then we have been to the prison answered the young girl and they told us you were ill good heavens why did you not warn us exclaimed marius sorrowfully we would have been more expeditious yes continued the flower girl now you are no longer jailer what are we going to do revert looked at them and seemed surprised at their despondency why are you in such despair he inquired at last i am rather unwell it is true i asked for a holiday but i still hold my post i shall be at your orders to-morrow evening if you like marius and fine uttered an exclamation of delight the man who answered you continued revert is taking my place for a few days to-morrow morning i shall go and resume my duties i have now only a little fever and can go out without any danger besides the matter is urgent i knew there was no occasion for despair exclaimed the flower girl triumphantly marius was trembling with emotion you did quite right to come and see me to-day continued the jailer after a short silence i heard this morning that m de cazalis was at aix and was doing all he could to hasten on the performance of the sentence they tell me he has succeeded in having it fixed for three days hence if m philippe should not get away to-morrow night i shall no longer be able to be of use to you for after to-morrow the prisoner will be transferred to the jail at marseilles marius shuddered he had come just in time he arranged with the jailer and made an appointment for the next evening he then ran out and told his now that the escape was delayed for twenty-four hours on the morrow the two young people remained hidden all day and having a certitude they were more calm the escape was to be made at eleven o'clock towards ten they repaired to the prison revertiga who was at his post gently opened the door and introduced them into the jail all is ready he said is my brother prepared inquired marius yes but i have had to take some precautions to save my responsibility as much as possible i wish the prisoner to appear to have fled by the window of his cell that's a capital idea uncle fine interrupted gaily this is what i've done 
continued robert Tega. this afternoon i filed through one of the bars at m philippe's window myself but is it necessary for my brother to go through the window asked marius anxiously not in the least we shall fetch him now and he'll walk out with us by the door only i shall remove the one bar and fasten a piece of cord to the others to-morrow they will suppose he escaped that way i shall all the same send in my resignation but by following this plan i shall avoid great annoyance robert Tega lit a dark lantern and the three proceeded towards philippe's cell they found him up and ready to leave but he was so pale and emaciated that marius hesitated to recognize him they greeted each other in silence refraining from speaking so as not to make a noise the jailer went to the window wrenched out the iron bar and fastened the cord fine had remained in the passage on the watch and all four then returned down the narrow corridors gliding slowly along the walls in fear of knocking up against each other in the dark marius had not let go of philippe's hand as soon as they had attained the jailer's lodge he threw a cloak over him hid his head in the hood and wanted to get away at once now that he had almost reached the end of his trouble he dreaded failure he started at the least sound robert Tega, who feared that the noise they had made coming along the passages might have given the alarm had the greatest difficulty in keeping him quiet for a few minutes being determined not to open the gate until he was sure that all was well when he had ascertained that absolute silence reigned in the prison he decided to draw back the bolts the two brothers with heads bent down hurried off towards the place des Prêcheurs, fine remaining behind for a moment to give her uncle the fifteen thousand francs she rejoined her companions just as they were entering the little rue st jean they then took the cour walking in the dark shadow of the trees they had now only one fear they must quit the town then closed with gates which the keepers were required to open to belated travellers and they were in dread of being stopped there miserably they continued walking glancing around them distrustful of the few people they happened to meet on reaching the rue des carmes they perceived a man who began following them their hearts were beating fit to break suddenly this person hurried forward and came and tapped marius merrily on the shoulder eh hey, i'm not mistaken he said it's you my young friend what on earth are you doing at this time of night on the cour marius in silent anger was already clenching his fists when he recognized the voice of m de Girous. as you see i'm taking a walk he stammered ah you're taking a walk continued the count in a bantering tone he looked at fine and particularly at philippe wrapped up in his cloak that's a form i know he murmured and he added with his friendly abruptness of manner shall i accompany you you wish to leave aix do you not they don't open the gate to every one i know a keeper come on marius gratefully accepted m de Girous had the gate opened without difficulty on the way he had not addressed a single word to the young people but when they reached the place de la rotonde he held out his hand to marius and said i'm going in by the obitel gate a pleasant journey and bending forward he added in an undertone i shall have a good laugh to-morrow when i see de casalis's face as marius looked after this generous man who hid his goodness of heart beneath the sour-tempered manners of a well-doer he was quite affected isnard was awaiting the fugitives with the cabriolet philippe wished to drive so as to receive all the night air full in the face he experienced intense delight in feeling the vehicle bearing him away in the darkness and appreciated to the utmost all the charm of liberty then came effusions of the heart and mutual confidences as the horse slowly ascended the hills fine and marius confessed their love to philippe and when the latter heard that they would soon be married he became sad he thought of blanche marius understood his feelings and conversing with him in an undertone promised to watch over everything during his absence in the meanwhile he would make active efforts to obtain his pardon and neither he nor fine would forget the exile the next morning philippe leaned on the bulwarks of the little craft bound for genoa gazed for a long time towards the shore of st henri right away above the blue waves he perceived a grey speck the house where poor blanche was shedding away all the tears in her heart end of chapters nineteen and twenty end of part two Part three, chapters one and two of the Mysteries of Marseille by Emile Zola. 
translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter i the conspiracy one calm evening in february about two months after philippe's escape blanche was taking a very slow walk twilight was just setting in far away the sea was quite pale and it broke sluggishly over the boulders on the beach barely making any spray under the impulse of the evening breeze the warmth of approaching spring could already be detected in the clear air in the grand blue sky of the south one sometimes meets with winter suns possessing all the invigorating heat of those of summer the young woman was taking short strides beside the cliff watching night falling over the waves which were turning a blackish blue whilst their plaintive sounds were becoming softer the unhappy girl was much changed she was barely seventeen and yet the terrible fatalities of which she had been the victim had caused her to stoop and had overspread her youthful face with the paleness of death all her strength all her gay and thoughtless life had passed away in tears she was about to become a mother and she walked along with faltering footsteps suffering more from mental trouble than from her position a few paces behind her came a tall thin stiff-limbed woman who followed her as a convict keeper does his prisoner she did not allow her out of her sight and watched all her movements this woman was the new guardian whom m de casalis had given his niece during the previous few weeks the deputy was then at marseilles where he had hastened as soon as he had heard that a child was about to be born he wished to be there on the watch this child this bastard which was about to make its appearance in his family exasperated him but his mind was made up and he was only waiting to put into execution the plan he had long since decided on when he had been able to absent himself and go privately to the cottage at st henri he came to the conclusion that his niece was not close enough a prisoner she must be completely shut up if he wished to carry out his intentions the first guardian he had selected appeared to him too weak and accommodating he had heard that a young girl came almost daily to talk to blanche and that made him particularly anxious it was then that he decided on entrusting the guardianship of the cottage to a vigilant jailer who would allow no one to enter it and who would give him a faithful account of the least incidents that happened madame lambert the stiff-limbed thin woman the convict keeper was admirably adapted for such a position she was an old maid brought up with exaggerated ideas of religious zeal had the harsh character of narrow-minded people and the unrelenting cruelty of those who have never loved she knew blanche had given way to the dictates of her heart and that made her all the harder all the more implacable she whom all men disdained she rigorously performed the duty m de casalis had entrusted her with watched over her prisoner with diabolical cunning surrounded her with absolute solitude and dismissed all who approached too near the cottage thus became a sort of citadel in which she entrenched herself and where she had blanche at her mercy fine was pitilessly driven away as soon as she appeared on the hill madame lambert placed herself at one of the windows and continued to spy her movements until she withdrew so the flower-girl in the end was obliged to give up her visits then poor blanche almost died of grief and despondency for she felt herself throttled by the coils her jailer set about her and which were drawn tighter every day abbe chastanier was the only visitor admitted and even when he came madame lambert arranged to hear what he said to his penitent on that particular evening blanche had obtained permission from her guardian to take a short walk on the seashore she was in great uneasiness and suffered from fits of giddiness which were calmed by the fresh air the two people continued to follow the cliff the young woman wondering how she could baffle the supervision which interfered with her plans the guardian glancing behind each rock in fear that some one would suddenly rush out and rob her of the prisoner as they were about to return they suddenly saw a dark form advancing towards them along the narrow path night had completely set in madame lambert was greatly afraid and was advancing rapidly in front when she recognized abbe chastanier the priest not having found blanche at the cottage had come to look for her on the beach let us go in quick said madame lambert sharply you will be more comfortable talking in the drawing-room the breeze is becoming fresh we are very well here murmured blanche let us remain a little while longer and she nudged abbe chastanier so that he might support her eh yes he said in his turn it is quite a spring evening the fresh air of the sea is beautiful and will do our dear invalid a deal of good then he took the young woman's arm and added gaily we'll walk along together my dear child like a couple of lovers 
if you are afraid of catching cold madame lambert pray go in we'll rejoin you presently and he continued along the path beside the cliff leading blanche who was laughing at his adroit manoeuvre along with him the guardian took very good care not to go in for she would have preferred to run the risk of catching twenty colds rather than lose sight of her prisoner for a quarter of an hour she therefore proceeded to follow the pair at a distance of ten paces full of anxiety straining her ears to discover what they said and angry against the waves the sound of which prevented her hearing she could listen at her ease in the cottage either openly or hidden behind a door but there on the rocks she did not dare she was unable to exercise her calling of spy how much i thank you said blanche to the priest in a sad and grateful tone for having helped me to procure a moment's conversation with you my prison as you see becomes narrower and narrower every day have hope my dear child answered abbe chastanier you will soon be free and you will then be able to act according to your faith and heart oh i was not thinking of myself they can do what they please with my personality without fear that i shall ever have the least idea of revolting besides you know my resolution your words have shown me the only road i can follow now it is not i it is providence that has brought you peace and hope blanche did not seem to understand but continued becoming animated little by little i have sacrificed all my pleasure and am pleased to suffer for i hope thus to obtain my pardon at times i would like to invent harder punishment to hasten my penitence then my child why do you complain of your solitude inquired the abbe gently it is not a question of myself my father if i alone were threatened with imprisonment perhaps for ever i would be resigned to my fate but i am trembling for the little creature i am about to bring into the world what is there to fear i hardly know if my uncle had not some plan he would not shut me up like this look at all the precautions that are taken to isolate me to prevent me communicating with you even i am certain that at this moment madame lambert is in despair you exaggerate no you know what i say is true and you are endeavouring to dispel my anxiety all this you see strikes terror into me and i fear for my child i fear a misfortune that i feel there in the dark she preserved a painful silence and then suddenly continued in a broken voice will you help me to save my child the priest was surprised and troubled at her cry he hesitated without daring to answer be calm he said at length you know i am devoted to you i repeat continued blanche that i have made the sacrifice of all my joy but i wish my child to be happy what can i do for you asked abbe chastanier moved by what she said madame lambert had approached little by little and was treading almost on their heels blanche heard the sound of her footsteps on the boulders and bending forward said to the priest in a low voice request fine to come here to-morrow at about six o'clock in the evening and to pass beside me without madame lambert being able to recognize her the next day blanche and her guardian were again strolling along the cliff at sunset during the daytime the young woman had been complaining of a violent headache and had passed the whole afternoon shut up in her room then towards evening she had feigned giddiness and complained of feeling sick in order to take the air beside the sea madame lambert who was full of distrust kept close to her determined that she would not allow the same trick to be played her as on the preceding evening whilst blanche from time to time looked anxiously towards the marseilles road as night closed in she saw in the distance a woman wrapped in a provencal cloak and with her face hidden in a large calico hood advancing from that direction at her quick light step she guessed it was the person she was expecting the woman came rapidly forward and as she passed by knocked up against blanche who handed her a letter murmuring accomplish my wishes i beseech you fine sweet face appeared for a moment under the hood with a kind consoling smile full of promise of devotedness and then the flower-girl continued on her way as quickly as she had come madame lambert thin and stiff had neither seen nor understood anything chapter two monsieur de casalis has a plan it was as blanche had said if her uncle had not formed certain plans he would not have shut her up in this way the desire to hide the young woman's condition did not justify the excessive precautions that m de casalis was taking to isolate her and keep her completely in his power 
the merciless part played by madame lambert the grave and severe attitude of the deputy the solitary life she was made to lead all warned the unfortunate girl that she was threatened with some cruel event which was being prepared in the dark maternal instinct told her that it was not her they sought to strike but the infant that was still unborn they were no doubt awaiting this little creature's birth and then something terrible would take place which she could not foresee but the thought of which made her tremble the fear which troubled blanche was exaggerated the solitude in which she lived caused her over-excitement and gave her horrible hallucinations m de casalis was not the sort of man to injure his reputation by martyrizing a child he merely wished to make blanche's heir disappear as promptly as possible but here in a few words is an account of the plan he had formed along with the reasons that urged him to act as he did blanche at her father's death was possessed of several hundreds of thousands of francs she was then ten years old she went to live with her uncle who was appointed her legal guardian and who from that time administered her fortune however he did not make any great inroad into her wealth but at the sight of so much gold in his hands he lost his head cut a great dash and spent almost all he possessed when his niece ran away with philippe he was in a dreadful fright of being called upon to produce the accounts of his guardianship for if this fortune had been taken out of his control he would have been reduced to absolute poverty as he had been living for several months entirely on his niece's money so long as the young girl remained with him he knew he had nothing to fear he could do what he pleased with her and bend her to his will like a piece of soft wax the child's weak character put him at ease such a doll would never dare to claim her own he was counting on marrying her or placing her in a convent whilst giving her the least money possible but the escapade of the two lovers had quite put him out of his reckoning if he had burst into a passion hunted them down taken his knees violently back home it was because he was afraid of a marriage between her and philippe he knew philippe and he knew that he was a man to make him give up the last piece of gold his interest was affected quite as seriously as his pride while he was protesting aloud against a misalliance he shuddered as he confessed to himself in his mind that this misalliance would not merely be a stain on his coat of arms but that it would also make a terrible hole in his purse through which all his luxury and power would disappear and now blanche was to have an heir and that heir would be more exacting than his mother all his calculations were upset he became merciless insisted on dragging philippe to the pillory sought to render him infamous in order to cast some of the infamy on his child and wished to deprive the infant of his rights before he even came into the world when he heard that philippe had fled and had thus escaped the infamy in store for him his anxiety became absolute terror he was ruined the struggle was becoming terrible if he were compelled to produce the accounts connected with his guardianship he would become literally penniless indeed he would feel extremely happy if he escaped so easily at the cost of poverty for he was not sure that he had not made too wide and visible an inroad into blanche's patrimony in the one case if he kept both his niece and her money with him he could continue to live in grand style and plunder the young girl in a legal way in the other if he were suddenly asked for a statement of accounts if the capital placed in his hands were exacted in the child's name he would be obliged to ask for charity in order not to die of hunger it is easy to conceive with what energy he accepted the battle and how eagerly he sought to triumph blanche for him was nothing at a simple look on merely raising the voice she trembled and consented to everything but he shuddered at the thought of the child that little creature who had not yet seen the light of day made the all-powerful casalis turn pale he caught himself hoping that it would be stillborn he would not have destroyed it out of a pride for his race but he prayed providence to do the work the poor little creature would grow up and some day prompted by the cailloles might demand his mother's wealth this thought brought cold drops of perspiration to the deputy's forehead the cailloles were his great terror if they ever became possessed of the child they would rear it as an instrument of vengeance then he thought of all the misfortunes that would fall upon his head he would have to disgorge hand over a whole fortune to these people whom he would have liked to crush and as for himself he would perhaps have to go begging along the roads those were the reasons that had made him shut up blanche in the cottage on the seashore 
he sought to isolate her from the cayolles to prevent them coming to an understanding with her and stealing the child as soon as it was born all the precautions he was taking were in the view of obtaining full and entire possession of the infant if he imprisoned blanche it was solely for the purpose of imprisoning her babe he had made up his mind to be there at the child's birth for the purpose of seizing it and preventing it being made the instrument of his ruin in the meantime he had instructed madame lambert to keep watch in the vicinity of the cottage and to see that no one penetrated within he feared surprise he said to himself that he would only be in safety when he had secured the babe sometimes at the bottom of his heart he was almost pleased that his niece had been guilty of an irreparable fault if she had married he would only have succeeded with the utmost difficulty in retaining a small part of her fortune now it was probable she would never marry she would enter a convent to weep over her shame and he could keep all her money with impunity he tolerated abbe chastanier's visits because he hoped the old priest would indicate religion to blanche as a refuge he felt that this way of getting rid of the unfortunate girl would certainly succeed when once the mother was in a convent he would attend to the little one his plan consisted in keeping it near him and bringing it up with care so as to endeavour to set its mind also on religion however he could not foresee the future the only thing he wanted was to have all the chances on his own side in place of immediate ruin he preferred the risk of a catastrophe in the distance his adopted son if son it were would grow up under his eyes and he would endeavour to get rid of him in an upright way either by persuading him to take holy orders or by getting him killed in warfare after having discovered a legal means to rob him of what belonged to him if it were a girl he would make her take the veil in any case boy or girl he must prevent the child falling into the hands of the cayolles at any cost we now know the plan that m de cazalis had formed he came to see blanche every morning accompanied by a doctor who gave him daily information as to her condition when she ventured to make a timid complaint as to the way in which she was imprisoned he flew into a passion spoke of the honour of the family and made her crimson by shouting out to her that she ought to bury herself in a tomb of her own accord to hide her shame from the world he wanted to finish with the business for he was anxious to return to paris where his parliamentary duties required his presence it being the middle of the session but he made up his mind not to leave until he had placed the newborn babe in sure hands each day he made madame lambert give an exact account of what had occurred during his absence and was particular in asking her if she had seen any one loitering near the house the guardian set his mind at ease no one had approached the place and he began to think there would be no contention for the child and so he was immensely delighted when he was informed one morning that the birth would in all probability take place that same evening but blanche had heard what had been said in an undertone and when her uncle and the doctor had left her room she dragged herself to the window and fastened a piece of white rag to the shutter End of chapters one and two part three chapter three of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three which tells of the effects produced by a piece of white rag to understand the events that are about to follow it is necessary to give a short description of the cottage on the seashore it was built in a rather peculiar way it had two doors one in the front which gave access to the rooms below and the other at the back which led straight from the ground to the room upstairs the cottage was built against the rock so that the first door seen from the country appeared to be only a ground floor the room occupied by blanche was upstairs to the left of the staircase and had windows facing the sea following on to this room was a smaller one which served as a dressing-room and into this opened the door at the back this door had a rusty lock and had perhaps not turned on its hinges for twenty years the key to it being lost it was never used when m de cazalis took the house he had not thought of troubling about this exit which seemed closed for good blanche some days before being laid up while looking for a pin she had dropped was very much surprised to come across a key hidden between the floor and the wall and her first thought was that it must belong to the door in question she was not mistaken it turned in the lock and pulling the door towards her she was able to gaze out on the country she placed her discovery in safety and spoke to no one about it 
being forewarned by a sort of instinct that she would in future have a means of safety in her hands on the day she was taken ill she fastened a piece of white rag to the window shutter and then after taking the key from the bottom of the drawer where she had hidden it went back to bed and slipped it under the bolster as soon as m de casalis heard that the baby would be born that evening he resolved to stay in the house and not leave it until the child was in his possession he retained a doctor sent for the midwife and dispatched a messenger to marseilles to fetch a wet nurse whom he had engaged some time previous and who was a creature of his own on whose fidelity he could rely when these precautions had been taken he awaited events to pass the time he went for a walk beside the sea feeling very anxious notwithstanding his busy frame of mind and thinking he would be lost if the infant escaped him he calmed himself a little by reflecting that such a thing was impossible as he would not leave blanche's door until the new-born babe had been taken away by the wet-nurse he walked for several hours along the beach casting from time to time a glance at the windows of his niece's room madame lambert was to come and call him as soon as all was over night closed in and he ended by seating himself among the boulders watching the shadows flitting across the cottage windows in the meanwhile poor blanche was in agony and at one time doctor and midwife despaired of her life she had been so weakened by sorrow that she was hardly able to bear up against the present physical trial she had a son but she did not hear the poor little thing's first cry pale insensible and with the appearance of a corpse she was lying on her couch of pain the infant was placed beside her the wet nurse not having yet arrived and madame lambert ran to inform m de casalis that everything had ended well and his niece was dying the deputy came in all haste very much annoyed to find that the wet nurse was not there he however restrained himself so as not to show his anxiety before the doctor and midwife at heart he cared very little about his niece's sufferings but in presence of her pale exhausted form extended on the bed he had to assume a concerned and affectionate manner turning to the doctor he inquired if there was still danger not at present was the answer and i think i can withdraw then pointing to the midwife madame's presence will be sufficient only i must impress on you that the patient must be spared all worry and excitement her life depends on it i will come again to-morrow the wet nurse arrived just as m de casalis was seeing the doctor out he returned with her into the house and severely upbraided her as they went upstairs to blanche's room the wet nurse excused herself as best she could and the deputy gave her his final instructions she was to take away the new-born child and watch over him from hour to hour with the greatest vigilance the following morning she was to leave for the village where she resided and which was situated in an out-of-the-way corner in the department of the basse alpes he hoped they would not go and ferret out his great-nephew at the bottom of such a hole as that he found madame lambert and the midwife silently bending over the patient's bed but when he approached to take the child so as to give him to the nurse he met blanche's eyes they had just opened wide and were fixed upon him he had the courage however to stretch out his arm then the young woman making a great effort succeeded in sitting up in bed and pressed the child to her bosom what do you want she said to m de casalis in a choking undertone the deputy started back the wet nurse is here he replied hesitating you know what was agreed you must give her your child he had told her a few days before the event that the honour of the family depended on philippe's child being sent away from the moment of its birth she had shewn herself as pliant as usual on hearing her uncle's brief and cruel words but she had hoped she would have been able to keep the new-born babe with her at least for twenty-four hours for it was on that hope she had based her plan for placing him out of harm's way when she heard m de casalis insist on the child being instantly handed over to the nurse she imagined all was lost if they took him away at once her plan was upset she had no time to put him beyond the danger that she foresaw with her mother's anxiety would be in store for him and she became still paler than before if possible as she pressed him to her bosom oh for mercy's sake she exclaimed leave him me until to-morrow morning she felt herself weak and was afraid of showing cowardice and obeying the deputy continued with a voice that he endeavoured to keep calm in order not to be overheard by the midwife you are asking me what is impossible your son must disappear for some time if you do not wish to be covered with shame i will give him you to-morrow pleaded blanche shuddering be kind 
permit me to gaze on him and love him until then that cannot do you any harm no one will see him to-night in this room it's much better to finish at once kiss him and give him to the nurse no i shall keep him you are killing me sir she uttered these last words in an heart-rending tone of voice m de cazalis said no more fearing to fly into a passion this unforeseen resistance surprised and alarmed him he was advancing to grasp the poor little creature which the mother held folded in her arms when the midwife who had been listening took him aside and told him she would not be answerable for his niece if he persevered in this odious scene he then saw that it was necessary to give way very well keep your son he exclaimed sharply the wet nurse will wait until to-morrow blanche placed the babe beside her then fell back on the pillow surprised and happy at her victory a pink tint overspread her cheeks she shut her eyes feigning sleep and felt full of hope and joy shortly afterwards madame lambert and the midwife seeing her quiet withdrew to take a little rest and m de cazalis remained for an instant alone with his niece who continued to keep her eyes shut he looked at the new-born babe and said to himself that this poor creature so weak and puny was his most cruel enemy as he was at last about to leave the apartment he fancied he heard a slight noise in the dressing-room he opened the door and looked but seeing nothing he thought he must have been mistaken then he made up his mind to go downstairs but with the intention of sitting up all night for in spite of himself he felt secretly uneasy if he had given way to blanche it was because he could not do otherwise the infant ought already to have been far away however he would get rid of him to-morrow that was understood and it was impossible for the cayolles to come and take him between now and then he had put bolts on the front door himself as soon as blanche was alone she abruptly raised herself in bed and listened attentively for she also had heard a slight noise coming from the dressing-room she rose with an effort took the key hidden under the bolster and staggered along clutching hold of the articles of furniture towards the door of the back of the house this was an imprudence that might kill her but she seemed borne up by superhuman strength and advanced along the tile flooring without reflecting that she was risking her life she simply said to herself that she was saving her son there was a scratching at the old front door and that was the noise which had attracted the attention of m de cazalis blanche who was giddy managed to get the key into the lock after having nearly fainted more than ten times and turn it the door opened and fine entered the note blanche had given her in secret a few days before contained these few sentences i have need of your affection and devotedness i know what your heart is like and i come to you as to a friend when i require your assistance i will fasten a white rag to my window shutter i shall expect you at about one o'clock on the following morning keep at the old front door at the back of the house and scratch against it softly to apprise me of your presence you will be my good angel when fine had perused this note she understood that it referred to philippe's child she consulted marius who advised her to comply precisely with the instructions blanche gave the next morning the flower girl placed a lad on the beach at about a hundred yards from the cottage with orders to come and tell her as soon as ever he perceived the signal agreed upon the lad remained at his post for nearly a week without seeing anything at last one morning he caught sight of the white rag and ran in all haste to marseilles in the evening fine and marius came in a cabriolet to st henri they left the vehicle in the village and both walked towards the rocks in the midst of which stood the cottage he remained in hiding at a few steps from the old front door while she scratched at it at the appointed hour blanche barely had time to let her in before falling into her arms in a fainting fit the flower girl promptly carried her to her bed covered up her shivering limbs and then hastened to bolt the door on the landing so that no one might surprise them after that she threw off her long cloak and gave all her attention to the invalid whose eyes remained closed blanche little by little recovered consciousness as soon as she opened her eyes and recognized fine beside her she raised herself up and with her heart full of joy and hope fell on the girl's neck and wept tears of happiness for a few moments neither was able to speak but fine catching sight of the baby took it up and kissed it then a stifled cry escaped blanche's lips you'll love him as if you were his mother won't you she asked the flower girl gazed on the infant with that tender look of girls who are in love and dream of maternity 
while contemplating philippe's son she thought with a blush of marius and said to herself i shall have a child like that then she placed the babe on the bed and sat down beside blanche listen the latter said rapidly we have very little time before us they may come upstairs and surprise us at any moment you are quite devoted to me are you not fine bent forward and kissed her on the forehead i love you as a sister she answered i know it and it is for that reason that i confide in you i am going to give you the most sacred legacy that any woman can leave behind her but you are not dead yes i am dead in a few days when i am well again i shall belong to the almighty do not interrupt me i quit this world and before leaving it i desire to give my child a mother for he will soon have none and i have thought of you and blanche gave fine a warm pressure of the hand you have done well said the flower-girl calmly you know i always considered that your child would be in a sort of way mine i need not tell you to love him said the invalid with an effort love him as you know how to love with all your heart love him for me and for philippe and endeavour to let him have a happier life than that of his parents she was choking with sobs but after a few moments continued although i have only to ask you for you to love my child i must implore you with joined hands to watch over him vigilantly from to-morrow hide him somewhere in some out-of-the-way corner endeavour to prevent any one suspecting the secret of his birth in a word swear to me that you will protect him against every one and keep him always near you as a sacred trust as she spoke she became excited and fine had to make her a sign imploring her to lower her voice do you fear foul play inquired the flower-girl softly i know not what i fear it seems to me that my uncle hates this child and i hand him over to you so that he may not remain in his power as i am unable to be there to watch over him i desire to leave him to an honest person who will make a man of him besides if even i were not going to quit this world i would refuse to keep him with me because i am weak and cowardly and would not know how to defend him defend him against whom i know not i shudder that is all my uncle is implacable but do not let us speak of that i give you my child and in future he will be in safety i can now go away in tranquillity of mind i was so afraid not to see you to-night and not be able to hand you this poor little mite there was a moment's silence and fine resumed in a hesitating voice as you are giving me your last instructions i may and indeed i ought to put a question to you i know you will not misinterpret my intentions i think you possess a large fortune which m de cazalis is administering yes answered blanche but i have never troubled about the money your son requires nothing now and so long as he remains with us he may be poor but we will bestow a wealth of tenderness and happiness on him still some day a fortune in his hands may be a powerful lever you do not intend to deprive him of your estate i told you i was leaving the world i shall be like one who is dead that is another reason for assuring his future ask m de cazalis for a statement of his account set your affairs in order before you disappear blanche shuddered oh i shall never dare do that she murmured you have no idea of the terrible power my uncle exercises over me a mere look crushes me no i cannot ask him for a statement however your son's interests require it no i tell you i have not the courage fine for an instant was silent and embarrassed her duty urged her to insist she would have liked to overcome blanche's cowardly attitude as you will not act yourself she continued at last allow others to watch over the interests of this poor little creature you make no objection to the fortune which you now appear to abandon being one of these days claimed on his behalf you are cruel answered the young mother with tears in her eyes you make me feel my weakness and powerlessness to act you know that i give you all authority then nothing is lost do not put your name to any document do not sign away a single inch of your property and moreover as soon as you are better let me have the certificates establishing your son's identity in that way we shall be strong and able to speak with authority when the time comes 
blanche seemed overcome with these questions of money had she been possessed of the least energy she would not have withdrawn from the struggle she would have lived for her child protected him herself and defended his interests the flower-girl guessed the tenor of her reflections and added in a lower voice if i have caused you pain if i put all these questions to you it is because there is a man who has claims on this child and who one of these days will himself watch over his interests i shall then want to give him an account of my mission and instruct him as to how he must proceed in order to complete it blanche burst out sobbing i have never spoken to you of philippe she exclaimed because i ought to think of him no more he left within me a love that has devoured and brought me to repentance tell him i have loved him to the point of quitting this world at the age of seventeen and tell him i entreat him to labour for the welfare of our son whatever he does will have my approval just at that moment fine heard the sound of footsteps on the stairs she rose hurriedly wrapped her cloak around her and took the child which the weeping mother was holding out to her and passionately kissing again and again this farewell was full of mute despair and anxious haste blanche got out of bed to accompany fine and close the door behind her on the threshold she gave the little one a last kiss on the forehead then she had only just time to pull back the bolt of her bedroom door and get into bed again her uncle entered softly End of chapter three